I'm Carrie from 1% of the Planet. We are here at Farm Stand in London today. Hear Rob Greenfield share his experiences about how to lead a zero waste life. It's a real personal honor uh, to be co-hosting tonight's event along with 1% uh, of the Planet. Uh, just can't wait to hear uh, Rob speak later on. Um, I also just want to say a big thank you to uh, Stephen, who owns Farm Stand. Um, I'm sure you'll agree this is an absolutely phenomenal location, um, and we really appreciate their hospitality. So, a little bit about 1%. We were founded back in 2002 by Yvonne Chenard, who's the founder of Patagonia. And we have about 1,400 business members in the network. Um, we're in over 40 countries. In the UK, we have about 70 members, and um, in London, about 10 members. So, to date, our UK members, or, or yes, our UK members have given back about a million dollars to environmental organizations that are also based in the UK. So, um, hopefully, we have the opportunity to grow that number and give back to those grassroots organizations that are on the ground, the experts in the field, doing all of the the hard work. So. We have programs available to everyone to participate, um, whether you're an individual or a consumer or a business. Um, we urge you all to get involved. So thank you all for being here. Um, really appreciate your time tonight. Okay. So I'll, I don't know, some of you may have, have seen my work before, some, a lot of you probably haven't, but I'll give you a quick, a quick run through of a couple of my different projects and maybe uh, get your mind spinning a little bit before we jump into it. So I've dived into about 2,000 dumpsters across the United States and maybe about 10 in the UK. Most of it's been in the United States. Um, but uh, I do this to raise awareness about food waste. That's one of the, the things that I'm most passionate about is showing people how much food is being wasted and get people thinking about the solutions. This is the food waste fiasco. Some of you might have seen uh, a trip of mine called People Are Good where I landed in Panama 4,000 miles from my house with no money, just the clothes on my back and passport. I had my shorts, my sandals, my hat, my shirt, which is this shirt right here, um, my uh, jacket, and my passport. And I landed in Panama with no money on a mission to make it home and show the world that the world, show people that the, the world is actually a pretty good place and there's a lot of wonderful people out there and that mainstream media may portray a lot more violence than really is and generally people are pretty good and that turned into a discovery show that was called Free Ride that you might have seen here in the oh thanks I'll just go like that and uh, <laughs> Trash Me so Trash Me was uh, my most recent project that was in uh, September October in New York City for 30 days I lived just like the average American uh, the opposite of, of every uh, the opposite of being conscious I just ate, shop, and consume like the average person does, but I had to wear all of the trash that I created to create a visual of how much garbage that the average person in the United States makes. So this is 30 days of trash, it's 87 pounds, uh, and that's about one third less than the average American. For most people, trash is, you throw it in the trash can, it's out of sight, out of mind, and you never think about it again. So this is to get people to stop and think about it. Oh yeah. And then uh, right now, I've been traveling for the last uh, 13 months. I left San Diego uh, March 3rd of last year, and I own just 111 possessions to my name. That's what it was when I left. It might be 100, might be 120 now. I don't know the exact number. Um, and again, this was to get people thinking about how much stuff do they actually really need. So all of these things that I've just showed you are extreme. And I'll give you a little disclaimer. The idea of all of this isn't to walk out of here and be extreme. The idea of all of this is really to catch people's attention, get them thinking outside the box, and inspire people to make positive changes in their life one little thing at a time, whether it's ditching the disposable coffee cups or plastic bags, riding a bike more, using public transportation, eating healthier. That's what it's really all about. So uh, you'll see more extreme things throughout this, but. Always remember that it's all about what can we do as individuals at work, at school, at home, to live in a way that's more beneficial to the earths, our community, uh, communities, and ourselves. So uh, I wasn't always uh, environmentally friendly by any means. In my early years, I was still a very passionate person, but I was pretty passionate about getting wasted, uh, binge drinking, women, material possessions, and money. And, and I'm this one. By the way. I feel like he could be look like me, but 
So anyway, I'm not partaking in this particular instant, uh, but I was plenty th for those five or so years. And so this here is another typical night. <laughs> this is called a duck bong, which I'm, how many people have ever uh, had a <laughs> duck bong? This is actually my only duck bong ever in history, and it happened to be caught uh, by some camera of sorts. I don't remember where this came from. And the, the funny thing was, I was a biology major, aquatic science concentration, so my, my university was learning about the world. But what, what the thing was is I never learned about how my interactions as an individual person affect the world. So uh, I never thought about, you know, I for me, I was really uh, passionate about fish, reptiles, and amphibians, all animals really. And I never really thought about how any of my actions, whether I was at home or at school or at a party, actually affected the world. So in 2011, when I moved out to San Diego, I started to really just happen to start watching some documentaries and started to read some books. And I realized that, wow, almost all of my daily activities are causing environmental and social destruction on the world, both right here in the community I'm in and all the way around the world. And the thing for me w was that up to that point, I had kind of considered myself an environmentally friendly guy because I always recycled, and I conserved water, and I turned off the lights when I wasn't using them because my, my mom had taught me some of those things. But what happened is I realized, OK, there's like five things I'm doing that are good and like 300 that I'm doing that are actually destructive. So at that point, I decided that I was going to start to change my life and, and try to live in a way that caused a lot less harm and try to live in a way that actually was beneficial to the world around me. At this time, I could have felt this utter doom and gloom, like, you know, what am I going to do? What can I possibly do? But instead, I had accumulated all this knowledge through documentaries and books, and I decided there's actually all these things that I can do. So I made this long list. Uh, it was about two, two uh, computer pages long, and I made this list of all these changes I wanted to make. And they were, they were simple ones on there, like, plastic, you know, ditching plastic bags and getting a reusable bag. There was, you know, not going to Walmart anymore and starting to shop locally. Um, and so I just put this uh, list up in a prominent place in my kitchen and then I taped a pen there with a string. And my goal was each week I would check off at least one thing, knowing that if I do one new thing a week, that's 104 changes in two years. So I could actually really transform my life a pretty substantial amount. So I actually felt really excited rather than gloomy. And so, you know, so, so these are some of the changes that I made earlier. Um, at that time, Walmart was my go-to spot. You have Asda here. I would get everything, everything I needed and everything I didn't need there. I'd fill up my shopping cart at least once a month. A lot of my food came from there and then just all sorts of trinkets. And so instead, I started to shop locally. So I went to the local farmer's market, local hardware shop. And I started to pay with cash instead of credit cards so that business, local businesses were benefiting more. Um, another big thing was just changing the food I was eating. So uh, I was eating a lot of, like I said, factory farm meat and things like that. And so switching to a more whole food, plant-based diet. So a lot more fruits and vegetables and a lot more grains and things like that and a lot less packaged processed food. So this was the switching to that. And then another big one was, you know, I was kind of unraveling my life. I was 25 at this point, and I was realizing all of these total misconceptions I had, and also really a lot of marketing lies that I'd been sold and that I'd totally chewed up. And so one of the big ones, um, The Story of Stuff, was actually one of the earlier short films that I watched. And they also have another one called The Story of Cosmetics. And I realized that. So many of these things I was putting on my body, the shampoo, the conditioner, the face wash, the Listerine, the, the deodorant, the, the oil, or the, uh, the Vaseline uh, moisturizer, the Carmex, I realized that all of these things are made out of these totally unnatural ingredients. A lot of them are made from uh, petroleum byproducts. And here I am rubbing all these things. And I learned that some of them actually make the problem worse rather than make it better. So one day I took all of these things and I just set them out on the curb. And then I thought, I'm going to see what happens 
if I just exist as a human being without all of these products. So I got a few natural things like toothpaste and coconut oil, but for the most part just stopped using those things. And then also got rid of the plastics in the house and the microwave. The main reason for the microwave so that was so that I would actually cook food rather than just throwing things in the microwave. And so for about two years, uh, I was just making all these changes. And what happened was I, I started to lose all of that beer fat that I had on me. Oh, I also stopped getting wasted. That was a, the <laughs> big one. No more duck bongs and, and all of that. And so what I found was that through all of these things, I was, actually, I think there's another. Oh, so another thing was really just starting to, to like dedicate a, at least a little of my time to doing something that was for others and for the environment. So I started to do trash cleanups. That's when I joined 1% for the planet. Um, and then what happened was I just found that I was way healthier and way happier. And so what, what it was is that things like eating healthier, I kind of was doing it for the environment, but I found that the more things that I was doing for the environment, the more I was actually doing it for myself. So the thing about all of this is it wasn't selfless because I was, I was gaining from all of it. Um, and then, so then in 2013, after doing this for a year and a half or so, I really, I decided that I wanted to do two things. One, take it a step further for myself, but two, bring sustainability to the attention of people that maybe have never had it uh, brought to them before. So for me, had I not seen any of this stuff, I could still be drunk dude instead of dude making a difference. And so I wanted to, to to you know, come up with a creative way to, to bring sustainability to people. So I came up with a bike ride where I was going to cross the country trying to have no, envi no negative environmental impact whatsoever. And so I, f the basic things that we deal with on a daily basis, food, water, energy, waste, transportation, these are the, the basic things that we deal with almost every single day. We eat every day, we drink water every day, we make waste every day, whether it's you know, trash or out of our bodies. We, uh, we have transportation every single day and we use electricity. So these are the things that we kind of do on a daily basis without a lot of the times ever thinking about it. So to really deeply think about it and to uh, do it in a way that brought it to people's attention, I set these strict rules for all these things. So food was the first one. So for food I had to bike all the way across the country eating only local, organic, unpackaged food. So <laughs> Food from w within whatever state that I was in, that's, that's what I meant by local. Organic as in not like certified, it didn't have to be certified, but the farmer wasn't spraying it with pesticides and using uh, chemical herbicides and things like that. And then unpackaged, so food that wasn't in trash, food that afterwards, after I ate it, I didn't have to go to a trash can. Um, so I had one exception though, because there's something in the United States called food deserts, which I don't think that's really a term that's used here, and you have a lot less of them in Europe, but a food desert is an area where there's no access to simply fruits or vegetables, really, that are fresh. So the idea of local, organic, and unpackaged in a lot of parts of the United States is just totally impossible. So knowing that, I made an exception, and that was that I could eat food that was going to waste. So I was crossing the Sierra Nevada mountains, and this was in 2013. I had never been dumpster diving before, but I was really in need of some carbs. That's the, the thing that I wasn't able to find local organic unpackaged. So I looked into a dumpster and was amazed to see that the dumpster actually had a whole bunch of perfectly good food in it. So I got a still frozen half gallon of Moose Tracks ice cream, which I ate about three quarters of right on the spot, some, some silk yogurt, which is like a vegan yogurt, and then bunch of fruits and vegetables. So on the rest of the trip, about 70% of my diet came from uh, grocery store dumpsters. And so the rule for water was that I couldn't use any water from on the grid. So I couldn't turn on a faucet, couldn't take a shower, couldn't use a washing machine. Uh, I couldn't use water from any source that came from on the grid. And uh, so, the, so what that meant is I had to get my water naturally. So if it was raining, I would throw buckets outside to collect the rain wherever I was, or like my rain jacket, or I would just sit in the rain and soak it all in. Um, and th again, I had one, one exception, is that was that, that, was that I could uh, use water that was also going to waste. So 
This was a fire hydrant that became a good friend of mine in Brooklyn. So for five days in, in Brooklyn, I lived off this fire hydrant. This is the leak right here. Um, so I drank from it. I bathed in it, as you can see. Uh, I did my laundry in it, brushed my teeth with it. This was my only source of water for five hot summer days. And so for um, electricity, the rule was I could only use energy that I created from my own little personal solar panels. So no, I couldn't have been standing in this room touching this computer using a projector for the entire summer. I couldn't turn on a light switch, use a refrigerator, um, plug in a computer or a phone to an outlet, basically use any electricity. So I had this little solar panel for my, my phone at the time. And then I had a bigger solar panel here that I used for my computer. And so I also had one little exception for this. And that's what I knew that when I was, so my, my laptop was solar powered and so was my phone. But I knew that when I was online that probably I was using some electricity from the router. So I knew that I was going to be using some electricity. But as I was doing this, as I was really stripping my life back to the basics and really diving into this, I started to realize all the ways that I was consuming resources without ever having thought about it before. So in, in uh, Boulder, Colorado, I visited a business called uh, Renewable Choice Energy. See, their job is to get huge companies like Facebook and Google to build solar farms and wind farms so that it's hosted on renewable energy rather than fossil fuels. But what I learned that, that moment is that the cloud, which is you know, where we're storing our stuff up here online, what that really means is just someone else's computer. And so I learned that every single time I uploaded a blog or uploaded a photo, that was being hosted on computers that were using electricity. And so every moment of my life, whether I was asleep or I was uh, awake, I was burning electricity. But only by really immersing in sustainability was I able to really learn these things in a way that I you know, was able to really dive so deep into them. So for, for trash, the rule was I had to carry every piece of trash that I created all the way across the country. So for example, like tonight I had a kombucha. And this thing isn't recyclable, so that would have had to have come all the way across the, I don't think this is recyclable at least. But so if I had a cliff bar or a candy bar in San Francisco, that was coming all the way to Vermont with me. So in 104 days, this is the amount of trash that I created. It was two pounds or a kilo, which is what the average person makes by about 1 o'clock in the afternoon you know, at home. Uh, and then for transportation, the rule was I couldn't use any fossil fuels to get across the country. So I had to bike the whole way. And if my bike wasn't working, walk. But my bike always worked. And so I made it uh, 4,699 miles. I used a ferry to get into Manhattan, which used about uh, a quarter of a gallon of gas on, from me. So when I got back to San Diego, I moved back into my, I was still in my apartment. And, um, and so I started to make more changes in my apartment. Some of the things that I hadn't done before, like switching over to LED bulbs to be more energy efficient, switching out the faucets so that they used less water. There were still changes that I was making. But there were bigger changes. One of the big ones is that I learned my money was in uh, Chase Bank at the time, JP Morgan Chase. And I realized that my money in the bank was funding the very projects that I was trying not to use. It was being used to invest in fossil fuels. So taking all my money out of the big banks, taking my money out of in any investments that I had. I learned that mutual funds, you know, my mutual funds at the time were invested in fossil fuels and also cigarettes. So taking my money out of those, those banks. So for another year and a half, I continued to make changes. And then in 2015, I decided that I wanted to try to live in the city with having really as little environmental impact. Because I found that when I was in an apartment, I still would do stupid things like leave the oven on for 12 hours and burn all that electricity. So I decided I wanted to live off the grid uh, in the city and demonstrate sort of extreme sustainable living. So I was going to build myself a tiny house. Originally, I was planning on trying to build a house out of a dumpster. This guy, Professor Dumpster, did it in Austin. So I was thinking about doing that. Glad I didn't. This was more comfortable. But I went online to, uh, to actually buy a van so that I could live in that while building a tiny house. And instead, 
I went online and I found this little tiny house for $50, or sorry, $950. It was 50 square feet. And I thought, that must be a typo. I mean, $950, that thing looks like it should be $9,500. But I went there and I realized why it was $950. It was basically just a little wooden box on wheels. But I thought, well, I like to do extreme things. I can't quite stand up in this house and, you know, <laughs> hardly fit hardly any possessions. But I thought, this would be a good way to get people thinking about, about the size of their houses. So here, I uh, practiced the same things about sustainability. For food, I grew some of my own food. These are my little, they're called wicking bed gardens. It's a little reservoir below. You water through a pipe in the top, and that fills up this little reservoir and then wicks up through the soil so it uses up to 90% less water. So I grew some of my own food but also really bought most of my food just at the local farmers market. Um, and so for water, uh, I harvested my rainwater off of my neighbor's roof. And so how this worked, uh, I was living without a single bill or debt to my name and, and still am. But what I did is instead of using money and entering the monetary system. I found someone with an empty backyard that wasn't getting used. Uh, I put out a, just a blog saying I was looking for a home for my tiny home and that uh, I would, in exchange, I would build raised bed gardens, I would do maintenance around the place, build a marine water harvesting system, and then when I left, all of that would be his. And so, um, so I had the backyard and then also his roof for, for harvesting rainwater. And so, uh, I used about two, two to five gallons of water per day there. And a lot of people would think in a drought, let alone a mega drought, in California, it would be impossible to live off of rainwater. But in a normal year in San Diego, being a desert, you can still harvest 10,000 gallons or 40,000 liters of water off of the average sized house. So here in the UK, off of the average sized house, it's probably more like 30 or 40,000 gallons, over 100,000 liters. So you'd be amazed at how much water you can actually uh, collect. And so, that's all right. Oh, well, we can go to the next slide. So one of the ways that I made this work is that I was only using, say, two to five gallons of water per day. But by using my water more effectively, so usually the water would be used three times. And the last time it would be, this is what's called gray water. So I'd be using it to grow food. And so my two to five gallons of water per day was more like six to 15 gallons of water because I was using it multiple times. And so this is a, one of those examples of something that's kind of extreme because the average American uses 100 gallons of water per day. And the average African uses two to five gallons of water per day. So where I was was the same basically as the average African, two to five gallons of water per day. Now when I'm on the, <clears throat> on the news and things like that in San Diego and they're like, this guy uses only two to five gallons of water per day. It seems extreme, but if you actually take, take things into perspective and realize there's actually billions of people in the world that use that same amount, then the reality is, is that I actually globally am the normal person and it's really what's extreme is the, the Western consumeristic way of doing things. So through all of this, one of the, the greatest lessons I've gotten is that everything is a matter of perspective. So no matter what you're doing, you're always going to have a polar opposite on, because we live in a world that has a lot of polarity. And so for me, it's been about really just changing my perspective. And as soon as I think about it that way, it kind of opens a new door for everything. So something that a lot of people feel is that it's only possible to live sustainably if you're wealthy, if you, you, know, if you have income. And there, there are elements of reality to that. But for me, one of the things that I saw is if you have a life that has hundreds of needs, then yes, it's going to be a lot harder to live sustainably with very little money. Solar is an example. If you have like two freezers and a refrigerator and a flat screen TV in every room and you've got you know, a juicer and, and a blender and you've got a hair dryer and you've got a you know, hundred electrical things in your house, then you're going to need a huge solar system that's going to cost you know, maybe ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000. But for me, I was living here with very little money. And the only reason I was able to live completely off solar is because I used very little electricity. So a lot of the times, the key is really simplifying. And the more that you simplify, often the easier it is to live sustainably. 
So anyone know what this is? Compost toilet. So this was, this is about uh, four years or so after I started my quest to live a more sustainable life. It took me four years to achieve the pinnacle of pooping in a five gallon bucket. And this was kind of a holy grail for me, like the idea of my, the idea of living in a self-sufficient way where I'm actually taking responsibility for all the aspects of my life. So this was a, this was a really important thing for me. I mentioned that you know, the average person in Africa uses two to five gallons of water per day. So when I started to think about that and I started to think, wow, every flush that I take is, is the equivalent of a half day or maybe even a whole day's drinking water or s water usage for one person. That's when I started to realize, wow, that's not the most effective using of water. And living off the grid, I wasn't about to use my whole water supply just for flushing one poop down a toilet. So uh, one of the biggest things that I've learned in, in everything is, is that every time that something's really easy, I always had to stop and question, why is, why is this easy? And so what I found is that usually when something is really convenient or easy, what it means is that the burden is being placed elsewhere. So for example, it, you know, one easy to understand example is when you're uh, driving a car versus walking or riding a bike. When you're driving a car, you're going zero miles per hour, and then all you have to do is take your ankle, go like this, and now you're going 60 miles per hour. Very easy. So where is the burden being outsourced? In that scenario, it's being outsourced to all of the energy from fossil fuels. All of the extraction that goes along with that, all of the pollution that goes along with that, all the people that are working to, get, to bring that to you. Versus riding a bike where you actually are doing the work. So applying that to this, when you flush the toilet and you just hit that little flusher and it goes down and disappears and you don't have to think about it or do anything about it, where is why is that so easy? Where is the burden going? So in the, in the case of flushing the toilet, a lot of people think you know, it's, it's water. You have a, an infinite amount of it. But there's all the chemicals that are used to purify that water before it gets to you and after it leaves you. Uh, there's all of the, uh, the pollution that's associated with it. A lot of times it runs off into our oceans. There's all of the equipment that has to be maintained and the pipes. There's all the people working. And then ultimately, it makes a waste product that becomes a problem. And in this scenario, with human manure is what it's called, human manure, uh, it's actually turned into a project, product. So in this, in, it's turned into compost. So in, rather than being a waste product that someone has to deal with, it becomes a valuable resource. So a lot of people are sort of fearful of the idea of human manure. And a couple of reasons. One, they think it, you're likely to get sick. and so. One of the things that I learned is that, who here has uh, compost be composted before? So a handful. When you have a good compost pile, it's actually steaming. And the reason being is that uh, compost, two necessary ingredients are micro and macro organisms. So bacteria would be microorganisms. Macroorganisms would be bugs, like worms and beetles and things like that. So all these things, when they consume, thi consume things, they create lots of heat. So it heats up the pile. So all of the bacteria and the viruses in our body, they're designed to live at about body temperature, so, which is in Fahrenheit about 98.6 degrees. So when the pile heats up to about 160 degrees, it kills all those things. So still, I, you know, on my YouTube channel and my Facebook when I would post about human manure, there was a fair number of people who just thought I was totally insane. And I would have thought I was totally insane five years ago, so I totally understood. But the thing that was really an eye-opener, I read a book called Wasteland by Elizabeth Reut. And I really then learned, what, where does all of our poop go? Because I, I had an idea. It's biodigested in part. And, and then what happens is there's a sludge. So in New York City, what happens with that sludge is a lot of it's actually turned into a fertilizer. So it's baked so that it kills all the pathogens. But in, in our toilets, you have all the things like uh, all of our prescription medications going down the toilet. You have Drano uh, and you know, chemicals that are used for cleaning. But then you also have all of this. So all this stuff gets mixed together. And then you have some extremely toxic poop. But then also along the, on the, along the lines, you have the places like 
the, uh, the, oil exchange, the oil changing places that are changing out people's oil. And they're not supposed to put it down the drain, but when they do, they're dumping all of that. So ultimately, you have this giant toxic poop slurry. And then what happens to that in New York? Well, it's turned into, uh, it's turned into a fertilizer, and then it's shipped to Texas to grow America's food. So I realized, at least I'm only eating my, you know, <laughs> and it's not even toxic. You guys are eating toxic, you know, like million people poop slurries. So the more, you know, that's one of the things through all of this. The more uh, that I've dived into the, the, all these things, the more that I've realized that generally we are just totally wrong, and most of our preconceived notions uh, often are just uh, are utterly wrong. Um, so that's my 10-minute spiel on poop, <laughs> which is my favorite part. It all goes downhill from here. <laughs> Next. <laughs> um, so for, uh, for trash, the, I just tried to create as little as possible. So at, this, uh, at the tiny house, I was creating about a uh, half pound to a pound or so a week, so a couple of pounds a month. So in a, in a normal month, I would create what the average American created in, in a day or so or about that. And then for transportation, so a couple years into this uh, simplifying my life, one of the things that I did was get rid of my car. And so a lot of people in London, I'm sure, don't have cars. San Diego is a place that it's a very spread out city. And if, if you think your public transportation sucks, then you should see the United States, which a lot of you have, I'm sure. One of the big things that I learned is that, so I'm sure the statistics are similar here, but the average American spends about seven to $9,000 per year on their car between insurance, registration, maintenance, and gas. And so that means the average American is working January and February of every single month just for car ownership. So imagine if instead of working January and February to own a car, you could maybe just enjoy life for those two months. So that's what I decided to do. And all of this, sure, it's about making the world a better place, but it's also about living a life that's happier and healthier. Um, so San Diego has a really nice thing called car to go. And here there's cars that you can rent by the hour. What is it? Zip car? So similar to that. But how this one worked is you, you had a little card and you stuck it up to this little meter. And then it just builds your account, account automatically. You just got in, typed in your PIN. You could drive it off and then park it in any parking spot. So it was a really cool really cool thing. Um, so that's what I did. Mostly I rode my bike, but would take car to go when I was feeling lazy or, or something like that. Um, so one of my, uh, do, you know, during all of this, my goal is, was never to be pigeonholed into one particular environmental issue. I like to keep it really broad and just kind of be able to focus on all facets of life. But one of the things that really just kept on coming back to me was food waste, how much food is being wasted. So globally, it's about one third of all the food that we produce. In the United States, it's said to be about 40%, but in reality, I think it's actually probably more than half of all the food we produce. So what that means is that the United States, as an example, there's 320 million Americans. And that means we have enough food to feed about 600 million Americans. We could feed another entire United States. And if you just took calories wise, we produce enough food to feed everybody in the United States and take over a billion people out of food poverty. That's how much food we're wasting. So it's $165 billion worth per year, which is more than the budgets for America's national parks, public libraries, uh, federal prisons, uh, the uh, veterans health care, the FBI, and the FDA combined. So it's a huge amount. But still, like those are just a bunch of numbers. And I may have even lost you for the last minute by rambling off those big numbers and statistics. So for me, with my work, it's all about how can I make things as easy to understand as possible so that people can wrap their head around it and make changes and ultimately possibly become change makers. And so we would go dumpster diving for just sometimes four or five hours, sometimes two days, and then take everything we could to, the, to a public park. So this is Burlington, Vermont. Just the perimeter of this is 104 frozen pizzas that were still frozen and not past the suggested sell-by date when I found them. Uh, this is Detroit, Michigan. So on this day, 
Uh, I had a food waste fiasco planned for 5 o'clock p.m. I woke up at 7 a.m., had not started yet, so I had 10 hours. Uh, and I had some volunteers picking me up with an SUV that had never been dumpster diving. So I was nervous because there was going to be uh, some, some larger media outlets there at 5. Um, so when they picked me up at 7 o'clock, I was pretty nervous. And this is what we had in the, sem or in the, uh, the SUV at 9 o'clock a.m. So this is two hours of dumpster diving in a city that I'd never dumpster dived before uh, with a bunch of people that had never been before. So I found that city after city after city, every city I've ever attempted this in has been usually limited only by the size of the vehicle that I had to transport the food. So this is Cleveland, Ohio. This is on a 95 degree day, uh, 95 Fahrenheit, so like 30 Celsius. So as you can imagine, a lot of the food in the dumpster was spoiled. The bananas, for example, this is maybe a tenth of all the bananas that I found. Uh, so this is just the good stuff that I managed to pull out. Uh, this is Lancaster, Pennsylvania, which is actually more of a rural area. So even in the more rural areas, you see it. Uh, this, is, this is Los Angeles. So this is the city, the city with the second highest population of homeless people in the United States. New York City is the first. And this is just the tiniest fraction of what's going to waste there. Um, this is uh, Orlando, Florida. Some of you may have seen Cheryl there uh, on my Facebook page or things like that. So when I first looked into a grocery store dumpster back in the Sierra Nevada mountains in 2013, I wasn't dating Cheryl at the time. I was very much in love with her, but she was very much, you know, beating me off, like, stay back, you know, I'm not, I'm not interested in you. Occasionally she would be interested and then not. Um, but anyway, <laughs> that's a whole other story. <laughs> um, <laughs> But, so, but here we are about three years later, and she's dumpster diving with me. She doesn't actually, she's never been in a dumpster, but she <laughs> happily stands next to the dumpster, and I pass stuff out. <laughs> and, and she eats from the dumpster sometimes when I prepare the dumpster dinners. So right here, this is proof, proof that you can eat from the trash and have the girl too. <laughs> Brilliant work moving to the next one. You knew the punchline even. So... Uh, this is San Diego. Cheryl helped with this as well. So San Diego is a city where, hard to believe it, but one, it's, its nickname is America's finest city, and it generally is a very fine city. Uh, but this is where one in four children in San Diego are food insecure while this much food is going to waste. And you have everything. I mean, uh, this is like even avocados, which are hard to get good at the store you could get from the dumpster in San Diego. Uh, so a lot of people ask me, what did you do with the food? And so when I was first getting into these food waste fiascos in 2014, I still wasn't nearly as confident as I am today when it comes to talking about environmental issues and worrying what people thought about me. Um, so I didn't know what to do with the food initially because I didn't know if people were going to want to eat it, what the stigma would be. So my whole thing was I was just going to lay it out in a public park and display it and then I didn't know what I was going to do afterwards. But at the first fiasco, people kept up coming up to me and saying, is this food for sale? And I'd say, no, it's not for sale. It's all from the dumpster. You can have it if you want. And what I've, every single food waste fiasco, about 80% of all the food was taken. So this is San Diego. And this is probably about 30 seconds after I said, <laughs> OK, you can take the food now. <laughs> and so the beautiful thing about this is that it was at these different food waste fiascos, anywhere from 10-year-olds to 80-year-olds, millionaires down to people who lived on the streets were eating this food. Just seeing all walks of life of people eating it was one of those really moments of like, all right, this food's definitely still good. I'm pretty sure of that. Um, and so then my most recent project was Trash Me. And so this was partly inspired by Morgan Spurlock's Super Size Me, where he ate McDonald's only for 30 days. So a lot of times when I'm biking, I'm just you know biking and brainstorming and thinking of things that are successful that really got people thinking. And so I thought, how can I apply Morgan Spurlock's Super Size Me to trash? So I came up with this. And so again, the idea is that most of us, we just throw our garbage in the garbage can, and then we never really think about it. You know, We never really think about where it goes. And so I like to do things in a way that you know, put it in people's faces, 
without actually putting it in people's faces. So all I did was live like the average American for a month, uh, you know, went to the grocery store, went to the coffee shop, just lived a pretty normal life. But the only exception was that I just had to wear every piece of trash that I created for the entire month. And so I wasn't telling anybody what to do or what they should or shouldn't do. But by doing this, everywhere I went, people asked, what are you doing? And then I told people. Um, and so the idea was just to associate our actions. So one of the things that really you know, was a huge aha for, for moment for me was I used to buy bags of potato chips, like you know, the, the little fun-sized one or one, one serving where you get like, what, 20 chips in there or something like that. And I realized one day, you know, I get five minutes of enjoyment out of this bag of potato chips. And then this plastic bag is going to be around when our kids, 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 and possibly more kids are on Earth. So does it really make sense for that bag of potato chips for that? And so, you know, here I am with a Panera Bread uh, package, and it's just really about uh, thinking about those sorts of things. So I placed all of the different items in this suit. I had a, a woman. Nancy Judd uh, designed the trash suit to be able to hold 135 pounds, because that's what the average person uh, has in a month. So I had a backpack to distribute the weight. Um, and uh, by the end, it was pretty difficult. So one of the things that you know, a lot of people think is that recycling is going to save the, save the planet. You know, There's that whole thing like, recycle, save the world. So, much to my dismay, one of the most depressing moments of the entire 30-day project was when I went to the recycling facility. So this is the recycling facility. This is recycling. It doesn't look like too beautiful of a thing, really. And so what I learned is that it's an extremely resource, uh, energy and resource intensive process. So I was really happy to learn that this recycling facility in New York that handles most of recycling has solar panels on the roof. And we're talking huge solar panels. Like more, I don't, know, I don't know, like that whole building worth of solar panels, giant amounts. And that only meets the needs for the lights on the roof. That's how much electricity it takes to recycle. And, how, and all of this uses tons of water. A lot of the times it releases parts of the plastic. So I learned that uh, you know, with, when it comes to waste, the key is to you know, a lot of the people that are in the zero waste movement, their goal is to not recycle more, but actually to recycle less. So it's reduce, reuse, and lastly, recycle. So minimizing recycling. So as I uh, said a couple of times, every, not everything that I do, but a lot of the things that I do are quite extreme. And they're really, uh, they're really designed to get people to stop and think, and hopefully inspire people to make positive changes. And so I want to go over some of the positive changes that we could make. These are all changes that I've made over the last five years. The nice thing about all these things is they all pretty much will actually all save you money, not <coughs> cost you more money. And generally, they'll make you a lot healthier, too. So the idea all was being more beneficial for the environment and causing less destruction. But ultimately, all of these things usually make you healthier and cost a lot less money. So for food, some of the things are eating local. So here, eating as much food as you can that comes from the UK. Trying to eat as much unpackaged food as possible. So when you're done eating, not having to visit the garbage can afterwards. Eating whole foods. So that simply means ideally foods that are one ingredient. So for example, eating an apple rather than applesauce, or potatoes rather than potato chips. And you'll find that it's a lot harder for uh, food companies to sneak nasty ingredients into your food also when you're eating whole foods. It's a lot harder to put pest or sorry, it, it's a lot harder to put preservatives into a potato than it is into potato chips. Uh, growing your own food, really great way to connect with your food and uh, just really it really if you've never grown food before, the first time that you plant a seed and then a couple months later actually are eating something from it, it can really be a totally life changing way of looking at the earth. So eating seasonal, so what that means is when you go to the grocery store and you look at those strawberries and it's January in the UK, you think, all right, do we grow strawberries in January in the UK? Probably not. So this means it's from Chile or something like that. Uh, eating food is one of the greatest things we can do 
you know, just not throwing it away and simply eating all of our food. Uh, and then uh, eating more fruits and vegetables, grains, uh, nuts, seeds, and less animal products. So these, this actually, in reality, when you're talking about the environment, would be up here. It's the single largest change we can make to decrease our environmental impact. What you will see is that although I do extreme adventures, I'm not extreme in the sense that it's all about doing what we can. So for example, you know, for, for eat it. You're going to waste a little bit of food for plant-based. Maybe it's not eating meat at every single meal and just eating meat once a day or something like that. Sometimes you're going to have to get, you know, sometimes you're in a sticky situation and you are going to need some packaged food, otherwise you're just not going to eat for the day. So it's all about, this is actually an area where it's all about moderation and just doing our best. So, uh, so the next one, water, actually eating more plants and less animal products is the same. So I did a, a project where I went a year without showering. It was, uh, it was one of my earliest projects that people saw. It was called Lessons Learned from a Year Without Showering. And so imagine going an entire year without showering, how much water you would save. It's the equivalent of, equivalency of six hamburgers. So imagine going an entire year without showering or just eating one less hamburger every two months. That's the same amount of water usage. So a plant-based diet saves a quarter million gallons or a million liters of water per year compared to a more compared to a meat-based diet. So other things you can do, these all still matter, uh, of course, but they are a lot smaller. But some simple things, uh, if it's yellow, let it mellow. If it's brown, flush it down. I'm sure, do you use that saying over here? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Who lets it mellow if it's yellow? All right, more mellowers. Uh, taking shorter showers, every minute you shave off your shower is two gallons, which is, you know, a lot of times what some people use for an entire day. Uh, growing food, not lawns. A lot of these things are really fun. So imagine, instead of watering your lawn, watering tomato plants that you actually get to eat. So uh, a lot of these can actually be really enjoyable. Harvesting rainwater, so a lot of these things people can really complicate, and you can get this whole, you know, $100 rainwater cistern, but you can literally just take buckets and put them under your, um, um, under your downspouts. Or find old food grade 55 gallon barrels and, and use those. Uh, so putting efficient faucets on. So there's faucets that use four times less water. So you just take the, a lot of them screw right off. You put this new one on, it costs $3. And then you're saving uh, about a, a gallon and a half or six liters per minute that it's on. Uh, Planting whatever natively grows, so planting things that normally grow in the UK. That way things are easier to maintain. And then installing gray water. So you have gray water that's really simple, like putting a five-gallon bucket next to your sink and then filling that with you know, your rinse water and then bringing that out to the garden, as long as you use a biodegradable soap. And then you have stuff that takes a little bit more work, for example, um, Laundry to landscape, where you actually change the pipes on your, in your house and your laundry, and your laundry goes straight out and waters a fruit tree. It takes a little bit more infrastructure, for example. Uh, for energy, so some of the things you can do, use less heating and air conditioning, putting, up, putting on a jacket, for example, if you're cold, turning things off when you're not using them, unplugging things. So one of the things that I learned is that there's something called a phantom pull or phantom draw or something like that. And what that means is that a lot of the times when stuff is plugged in, even if it's off, it's still using a little bit of electricity. Switching to LED bulbs. So LED bulbs use 10 times less electricity. So if the saying, a penny saved is a penny earned, those bulbs are making you money in a couple of months to a year, depending on how much you're using it. Washing clothes less and hang drying. Uh, finding an electricity-free alternative. So for example, having a a hand-pressed juicer rather than an electric one. Um, investing in alternative energy, putting solar panels on your roof, or if you can't do that, invest, uh, investing in an alternative energy co-op, which I know that some of those exist in the UK. I know they have one in Bristol. I don't know if they, they do here. And then another one, just spending as much time in nature as you can, because when you're in nature, you're not using electricity. And then waste. So the five R's are refuse, reduce, reuse, repair, recycle. So, and it always goes in that order, a hierarchy. So 
Refuse stuff that you don't need. Reduce, reuse things when you can. Repair things when they can be repaired. And recycle as a, as a last ditch effort. So BYO, like bring your own cup, bring your own uh, water bottle, bring your own plate or your utensils so that you don't have to use disposable stuff. Say no to disposable items. So anytime that someone's going to give you something that you would only use once and then throw away, think about it and think of an alternative where you're not throwing stuff away. Uh, buying unpackaged food, food, buying used stuff rather than new stuff. So you have like Gumtree and FreeCycle and things like that where you can get used stuff. Um, repairing things, donating stuff to thrift shops rather than throwing it away, uh, buying quality stuff that lasts, um, composting instead of throwing your stuff in the garbage. Transportation is the last one. And so one huge one is not having a car and using uh, public transportation, walking and biking. Uh, you can join a car share program. So if you do need a car, you can use uh, Zipcar or something like that. Driving less, if you do have a car, is a simple one. A big one is getting a bike rack. So if you, if you bike and you want to be able to do errands, having a rack on your bike allows you to go grocery shopping and all sorts of things like that. Public transportation, living near where you are, so that way you spend a lot less time. Uh, you can act, you know, if you're spending two hours less commuting, then you're more likely to be able to spend it doing the things that you really want to be doing, and then walking. And then lastly, um, one of the, the big ways that you can make a positive environmental impact is to support nonprofits and organizations that are making a big difference. So there's certain things that sometimes it makes sense to join forces with something that's already doing the job. So for example, maybe it doesn't make sense to grow all of your own food. So join up with a nonprofit that's growing food that does CSAs or something like that. So volunteering at nonprofits is a really great thing to do. And then also donating. So 1% for the Planet originally was a network of businesses that give 1% of their revenue to environmental nonprofits. But now it's actually open to individuals. So it, it launched about one month ago. And so now individuals can pledge to give 1% of their uh, income or their net worth to environmental nonprofits. And the nice thing about it is if you just make 10,000 pounds a year, then you commit to giving 1% to environmental nonprofits. If you make 100,000 pounds in a year, then you're giving 1,000. So it's something that really just about everybody can do. So that's everything. Did I bore you? All right, cool.